Hi, my name is Bridget Motif with the San Juan Soil and Water Conservation District in the northwest corner of New Mexico. Welcome to our Backyard Conservation Workshop video series. Today, I will be going, be going over the biology, impacts, and management strategies land, landowners have for managing and dealing with the invasive species cheatgrass. Cheatgrass, or also known as downy brome, drooping brome, june grass, military grass, or a whole array of other common names, is found widespread throughout the western region as well as into parts of the eastern region of the United States. Cheatgrass is considered a Class C noxious weed in New Mexico, which means it's very widespread throughout the state, and management decisions for this species are best left to local level decisions based on infestation level, resources available, and managers' goals for this plant. Cheatgrass was introduced from Europe in the late 1800s. It was thought to be brought over in an infested seed bag, and due to its origins, it was very pre-adapted for the western region, and con that contributed to its widespread, rapid infestation of this area. There are a few key features of cheatgrass that make it fairly easy to identify. As you can see from the picture, the seed heads all droop to one side. The seeds tend to flare out towards the bottom. It kind of looks like bell-bottom pants in a way. The awns, which are the spikes at the bottom of the seed heads, are generally straight and about a half an inch long on mature plants. Downy brome is one of the common names for this plant, and that comes from the soft hair on the leaves and the stem. And the hairs on the stem are helpful in distinguishing it from other grasses, especially when it's young before the seed heads are prominent. These pictures show dried up cheatgrass, but when it's younger and before it matures, the plants are green colored, and as it matures, they turn from green to more of a purple red um, as the seeds mature. And plants can range anywhere from six to 24 inches tall. It is a winter annual, which helps in its competition with native perennial species. The seeds sprout in the fall, and they overwinter as seedlings, but then they bolt in the spring, and they typically establish their roots when the temperatures are still cold, and it gives them an advantage of exploiting the moisture early, which helps the cheatgrass outcompete the native species when the native species are still dormant. And where cheatgrass is present, it can use a large proportion of soil moisture which depletes the soil for the other species that are trying to establish themselves. They're also highly productive, so a single plant can produce up to 500 seeds in favorable conditions, which is a lot for one plant. And depending on soil type and precipitation, the seeds can remain viable for three to nine years, depending on the conditions, which makes it a very strong competitor uh, with other native species. There are several ecological and economic impacts that cheatgrass can have uh, in a, across a widespread area. One of the greatest impacts is the displacement of native vegetation. Once it outcompetes native plants, it can grow in large densities forming near monocultures. This reduces overall plant diversity and can de decrease nutrient availability and productivity. This also has pot potential to reduce crop yield and quality um, when cheatgrass invades cropping systems. Another major concern of cheatgrass invasions is the alteration of fire regimes and the creation of a positive feedback loop resulting in near monocultures of cheatgrass. Cheatgrass increases the continuity of fine textured fuels, which then in turn promotes larger and more frequent fires. Because the fire return interval is shortened, perennial vegetation is unable to recover from these fires that are burning more intensely and more frequently. And at the same time, cheatgrass continues to increase, promoting larger and more frequent fires. So there's the positive feedback loop. The more fires, the more likely cheatgrass is able to reestablish itself, and native perennial grasses are not able to come back. Although cheatgrass can provide some good nutrition and forage for livestock during its early stages of growth, the window that livestock is able to digest and eat the young plants is much narrow, narrower than native perennial grasses, and year-to-year -year production of cheatgrass forage varies widely, so it's an unreliable source for the livestock. And this causes a significant cost in forage quantity and quality, and can affect both livestock and wildlife that also rely on this.
Once the seeds dry out and become mature, they become very sharp and the seeds can actually injure the eyes, nostrils, intestines, and mouths of the grazing animals, which can become a huge problem. Now we'll get into some of the management methods that can be used to treat cheatgrass invasions. Because cheatgrass spreads by seed, the goal should be to prevent seed production and spread, and doing so will stop it from further invading other areas. And in combination with the prevention of spreading, uh, it's desirable to reseed with native perennials so that it stops the return of cheatgrass. In general, there are four categories of methods that are used in management, including physical, cultural, biological, and chemical. Your management method will be site-specific, so it's important that you come up with a plan prior to implementing any method that details what your goals are, as well as what, where, and when, and how you will implement your strategy. This includes if there's any monitoring that needs to be done and follow-up, as well as retreatment if necessary because in the long run, this will save you both money and time, which are both very valuable. An effective plan often utilizes multiple methods. It's not a one size fits all, so it's very site specific as to what method you should take, and it's often a combination of methods that's most successful. The first category of management method that we'll go over is physical. Because cheatgrass really thrives in disturbed areas, it's generally best to avoid heavy disturbance through physical management, which can be done. So hand pulling can be an effective method in small patches because of the shallow root system of the plants. But be sure if you do that to carefully bag and dispose of the viable seeds because of how long they can last and how quickly they and easily they can spread. If physical control is used, uh, multiple treatments to bury the cheatgrass seeds at least four to six inches deep to suppress their germination is recommended. Physical control followed by chemical application also may help to reduce the abundance of seeds in the seed bank. As far as cultural methods go, removing seeds from animals, clothing, and machines or vehicles when moving from an infested area to an uninfested area is very important to help prevent the spread of seeds. Because those seeds are very spiky, they stick to a lot of materials and disperse very easily. So being aware and avoiding transferring seeds is a great way to stop the spread. As in terms of biological methods, um, some targeted grazing prior to seed production has shown some success, but be sure to avoid heavy grazing as overgrazing can cause the large disturbance where cheatgrass thrives and that will promote a further infestation of cheatgrass. Late fall and early spring are generally good times for that targeted grazing. You have the small window where it's young and before the seeds are mature or produced at all. The last category is the chemical method of management. Chemical control or the use of herbicides is the most widely used weed control method in pastures and rangelands and it has um, shown a lot of success in managing cheatgrass. This method has several advantages for the species, including avoiding the disturbance of soil, which further facilitates infestation. And it also is very flexible to whatever your goals are and treatment needs are. The type of chemical and application method will be specific to your site and management goals. Non-selective herbicides are generally the primary chemical available for control of cheatgrass. And since non-selective herbicides can kill all vegetation that they come in contact with, not just the problem weed, it, you have to be very careful of what areas you're using it in and that you're not killing off desirable plants. The USDA has several recommendations for chemical treatments for cheatgrass, including fluazepop, metribucin, glyphosate, and bromosil. Be sure to follow all label instructions as the label is a legally binding document and also be sure to follow all local, state, and federal guidelines. Use, the use of herbicide by itself is not sustainable and plant competition is really going to be the key to weed management. We want to create a healthy plant community that is going to be resilient and resistant to future weed invasions. Reseeding with desirable native perennials can be a good way to help restore a healthy plant community after you've treated with chemicals.
Thank you all for joining us in learning more about cheatgrass and the management practices best used on this noxious weed. I wanted to share some additional links to resources that were used to create this presentation and also that you could use to go more in depth about the biology and management of cheatgrass. And as I said before, a great resource to utilize is your local extension specialist as they will have the inside look at what your area is best suited for and what management practices will work best for you. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and be sure to check out our other Backyard Conservation Workshop videos for other management needs you may have. And good luck with your weeds.